Okay, so now we're going to consider a um, really simple um, but very rich example called the stick and puck. And in order to solve this problem, we're going to have to use conservation of energy, conservation of linear momentum, and conservation of angular momentum. All three quantities, energy, linear momentum, and angular momentum, are strictly conserved. Okay? Neither can be created nor destroyed. They are strictly conserved quantities. And those three conservation laws are very powerful. And we're going to see how powerful they are to solve this really interesting problem. So it's a great problem. If you can master this problem, then you're doing uh, really well. Okay, so the, so the picture is something like this. We have a flat, horizontal, frictionless surface, like a sheet of ice. And sitting on that surface, that frictionless surface, is a stick. And there's going to be a puck sliding towards the top end of the stick. And it's going to hit the stick, and it's going to cause the stick, the center of mass of the stick, to, 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 to move with constant velocity to the right, and the, the stick to rotate about its center of mass. Okay, so it looks like this. It goes boom like that. Okay? <clears throat> so the picture looks something like this. So we start with a stick um, sitting on the surface of the ice flat, horizontal, frictionless surface. And so that stick has a mass, big M, a length, little l, and a moment of inertia for rotation about its center of mass, ICM. Now, of course, if it's a thin stick like this, it's 1 12th ml squared. But we don't need to know that. Okay, so that's the center of mass point of the stick. And then what we're going to have is a puck coming in from the left, and it's going to hit exactly that top point of the stick. And so we have a puck coming in. It's got some mass, a little m. It's moving with some velocity, little v, to the right initially. And so it has some initial uh, linear momentum uh, to the right, little p equal little m times v. Okay. And then what happens is that puck uh, hits the top of that stick, and then um, and then the stick takes off to the right. Okay. So in order to, uh, as we're solving this problem, it's definitely going to involve things like angular momentum and torque. Okay, and so whenever we're talking about angular momentum and torque, we have to, we always mean angular momentum and torque evaluated about some fixed point in the inertial reference frame. So a convenient choice for that fixed point is right here, right at the center of mass of the stick in its original position. Okay, so we'll choose this as our point O. Okay, and so, so this is this point O is at the center of mass of the stick in its original position. Of course, later the stick's going to go that way, but O will not move. This, the center of mass of the stick will do this, but O will not move. This is the origin for our inertial um, uh, reference frame. And so we'll take the i hat direction to be to the right, the j hat direction to be up, and the k hat direction to be coming out of the board, okay, towards me. Very good. And what else do we need here? Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so after the collision, what's going to happen, this point O remains the same. This is our fixed point O, and this is our axes. Uh, so this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, this is the z-axis coming out. And after the puck has hit the stick, then the center of mass of the stick has translated to the right like this. And also the stick is rotating about its center of mass. Okay, so um, maybe a second after the collision, we will suppose that the center of mass of the stick it has moved to this location, right over here. Okay, and so the stick is also rotating, and so we'll kind of draw it like this. How will we draw it? Something like this. Okay, that's a terrible stick. <laughs> Let's redraw that stick. Okay, so it's about that long. So it looks like that. So the center of mass point of the stick at this instant of time is over here. And that center of mass is moving to the right. So yeah, there's rotational motion, but there's also translational motion. So there's linear momentum associated with this, um, with this stick in motion. And that linear momentum, we'll call that capital P. Okay? And that capital P will equal the mass of the stick, M, 
times the velocity, capital V, cm, of the center of mass point. Okay, so the stick is, the center of mass of the stick is, is translating to the right with a velocity vcm, and so the linear momentum associated with this object is mass times the, the center of mass velocity. Okay, so we've got that, and also the stick is obviously rotating in the clockwise direction. So the stick is rotating in the clockwise direction like this, about its center of mass point, and so the, the so the angular velocity vector of the stick is curl your fingers in the direction of the rotation and your thumb points in the direction of the angular velocity. So the angular velocity is in the, if k hat is coming out of the board, then the angular velocity will be going into the board. So there's an angular velocity vector omega of the stick. And this is into the board. Okay, very good. So we start with this guy at rest, and the puck, so the stick at rest, and the puck in motion. After the collision, the stick is definitely in motion like this. It has two kinds of motion, a translational motion, added to that a rotational motion. Those two motions combined look like this, okay? <clears throat> what, about the, uh, what about the puck? Well, um, that depends depends totally on the situation. Depends on whether it's elastic, inelastic, depends on the moment of inertia of the stick, and so on. So imagine that the moment of inertia of the stick is very large, and it's an elastic collision. So it's very hard to get this stick rotating. Well then if that puck hits this top of the stick elastically, it's gonna bounce back. And so the final velocity of the puck after the collision is gonna to be to the left. However, if the moment of inertia for the stick is very small, so it's a very light stick made out of styrofoam or something like that, and this big heavy puck hits it, well then that puck is just gonna plow on through, and the final velocity of the puck will be to the right. Okay, so it totally depends on the moment of inertia of the stick, it depends on the relative mass, little m to big M, and so on, whether it's elastic, inelastic, so it's a very complicated situation. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume the simplest possible situation. And then we'll look at what that means, because it's actually really cool. So we will imagine the simplest situation, which is something like what happens with billiard balls of equal mass. Right? With billiard balls of equal mass, if you start with one of them at rest, like this stick, and the other one coming in with some momentum, and they are exactly equal mass, and they have a perfectly elastic head-on collision like this, what happens is the, the first ball comes to rest, and the second ball takes on the momentum of the original ball. And so, and so it looks like this, right? With exactly the same velocity coming in as going of the first ball as the second ball going out. Okay, so let's imagine that we've observed this happen, and we see that that that, that puck, as soon as it hits that stick, it goes kunk and 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 it comes to rest. The stick takes off, but the puck comes to rest. Okay, so after the collision, the puck is sitting in exactly this location over here. Okay, so while well, this puck is like a, a, it's like a point particle, okay, um, and so it's, it's come to rest there. Okay, so, uh, so the puck was originally moving and the stick was at rest. We're going to assume, and then see what happens, uh, that, the, that the stick moves off with some uh, translational and rotational velocities, but uh, the, the puck is, uh, comes to rest afterwards. So what are the consequences of that? This is actually really cool. Okay. So what else should we put in this picture? Um, well, we're going to have to, um, um, we're going to be calculating torques and angular momenta and so on. So we're going to have to identify uh, the positions of these objects relative to our preferred point O, relative to our fixed point in the inertial reference frame. Okay, so, in, so before the collision, the position, of course, of the center of mass of the stick is right at the point O. And the position of the puck is, we'll give that a name uh, vector little r, okay? <clears throat> and now after the collision, the puck is located up like this, so r has changed from that vector to that vector. The position of the center of mass of the stick has changed from being at the fixed point O to being some distance to the right of the fixed point O. And we will call that vector capital R. Okay, so I think that's all we need in this, in this picture.
Um, yep. Okay, so now our let's just sort of define our system over here. So our system is equal to a puck plus the stick, puck plus a stick on frictionless. Frictionless surface means that the surface, as an as external to our system, puck and stick, can exert no horizontal forces whatsoever, and so no torques uh, associated with horizontal forces or anything like that. So it is frictionless. The surface is also horizontal. Okay, and so uh, the gravitational force will be horizontal surface. Okay, and so when we think about external forces acting on our puck and our stick, yeah, there are some. Okay, so there's going to be a force of gravity pulling down on both the puck and the stick, okay, which is in that direction. But then there's going to be an equal and opposite normal force that the, that the ice exerts back on the puck and the stick. So sure, there are external forces <coughs> acting on our our two objects that make up our system, but those those forces, the net force adds up to zero. The net external force adds up to uh, adds up to zero, and also the torques that the normal and the force of gravity exert uh, would also add up to zero. You know, if there's a normal force like this, you know, then the torque exerted at that point is you know r cross force is that way, but then the gravitational force is that way. So r cross gravitational force is that way. So torque that plus torque that is equal to zero. So there's no net torque. Uh, there's no net torque produced by external forces. Okay, so that's super important. So if this is the case, it's saying that the sum, where should I put this down here? So the sum of the external forces, there are external forces, but they sum to zero. And also, uh, there are external uh, torques acting on different parts of the system and so on, but they also sum to zero. The sum of the external torques is also equal to zero. Both of them are equal to zero, which is the same thing as saying that the system is isolated. It is isolated from, from external influences. And if it's isolated, that means that the linear momentum of the system uh, can't change. So whatever linear momentum you had to begin with has to be the linear momentum you have uh, in, in, in the final situation after the collision. And also the angular momentum of the system. Whatever angular momentum of the system you had to begin with has to equal the angular momentum in the system afterwards. Okay, so we have that. So, <clears throat> so let's look at first conserva uh, conservation of linear momentum in the form that the linear momentum of an isolated system can't change. Then we'll look at conservation of angular momentum in that the angular momentum of an isolated system cannot change. And then we'll look at conservation of energy. So the energy of an isolated system cannot change. Okay, And so this gets really interesting. Okay, So the first one we'll look at is conservation of linear momentum in the form of for an isolated system, the linear momentum can't change. Okay, so let's look at the linear momentum in the system initially. Well, initially, uh, this object has, the, the stick has no uh, linear momentum, but the puck has a linear momentum p to the right, little p to the right. So, little p, the puck has a, has a linear momentum little p to the right, and the stick has a linear momentum zero. Okay, and after the collision in this situation over here, the system has some uh, linear momentum final. And what is that? Well, the linear momentum of the puck is zero because it's at rest. So that's zero. Plus the uh, linear momentum of the stick. Now remember, this stick is doing two things. Its center of mass is moving to the right with a speed VCM. So it's, there's a translational motion involved like this. Plus, on top of that, there's a rotational motion without translation. And when you add those two together, you get this kind of motion. Okay? So the linear momentum is associated with just an object of mass, big M, moving to the right with a speed VCM. That's big P. Okay? So the linear momentum of the stick after the collision is big P. Okay? And so that's it. And so conservation of, of linear momentum
says that, um, where should I put this? Let's put it down here. Okay, so it says that little p is equal to uh, big P. So what's happened is the puck had some linear momentum to begin with, and then after the and, and no linear momentum in the stick, and then the puck came to rest, and so it must have given conservation of linear momentum says that it must have given all of its linear momentum little p into the linear momentum of the stick, big P. So little p is equal to big P. Okay, um, or in other words. Another way to say this is, so little p is m times little v, that's equal to big M times big Vcm. Okay, or in other words, um, little v, um, sorry, big Vcm, so the velocity at the center of the mass of the stick after the collision, big Vcm, is equal to little m over big M times the initial uh, um, velocity of the puck to the right. Okay, that's another way to look at this. Okay, and so this is exactly analogous to this situation that we considered before. So we have an object of mass, say, little m, uh, moving with some velocity v to begin with to the right, and it's going to collide with an object of mass big M, so that's little m, and that's big M. It's going to collide with an object of mass big M that's initially at rest. And we're going to assume the collision is like this. Bang, this guy comes to rest, and this guy takes off. Okay, And so um, little m, after the collision, is at rest. And big M is moving to the right with a velocity vcm. Okay, And so the linear momentum to begin with is little mv. The linear momentum afterwards is big M VCM. And of course, those have to be equal for conservation of linear momentum. And so we get this or this, same thing. OK, so what we're doing here, and this is very important, we are splitting the motion of, of, the, of the stick into translational motion with linear momentum big P equal to big M VCM, uh, plus, uh, so translation without rotation, plus rotation without translation. Okay, so that's, we're going to do that when we come to conservation of angular momentum. Okay? Now, one thing I want to say is it, seems, it, may, it might seem kind of weird. If you've got a stick like this and you hit the stick at the top like this, it, uh, why is it that the center of mass moves exactly to the right like this? Why isn't it something like the center of mass moves down at an angle like that? Well, think about this for a second. This is very important. When the puck and the stick are in contact, it's a very brief collision with large forces. The force that the puck exerts on the stick is exactly to the right. And the momentum that is transferred to the stick is a force acting over time. So that right-directed collision force acting over time is the amount of momentum, linear momentum, transferred to the stick. It's exactly to the right. And that linear momentum is stored in the translational motion. Now, on top of that, there's also a rotational motion, but definitely the translational motion has the center of mass moving exactly to the right. Okay? That's important to sort of see that point. Okay, <clears throat> so next let's look at uh, conservation of angular momentum. Okay, so we know that because there are no external torques acting on this system, there certainly are internal torques, but there are no external torques. Internal torques will not change the angular momentum of the system. It doesn't matter what happens in this collision. Okay, the angular momentum will remain the same. Okay, so um, we have that the system angular momentum, because it's an isolated system, can't change. So delta L cis equals zero, L system initial equals L system final. Now, what's really important is we are uh, we are evaluating angular momenta and torques about our chosen fixed point. This point is the same in both pictures. It's right there. It just hasn't moved. Okay, And so this is about the fixed point O. So about the fixed point O, we have the following. Okay, So initially, we have that the angular momentum in the system initially, well, let's see, it's the angular momentum in the puck plus the angular momentum in the stick. 
Now, the angular momentum in the puck, remember, it's super important. So even objects that have that are just in linear motion like this. Like this puck is just moving along a frictionless surface. Its momentum, its linear momentum P is constant. It's just moving along a straight line like this with a constant speed. And yet that has angular momentum about this point. The angular momentum it has about this point is clockwise. The angular momentum it would have about that point, point is counterclockwise. The angular momentum it would have about any point along its line would be zero. The angular momentum depends upon the point you've chosen. We've chosen that point. So this, uh, this object in linear motion has a clockwise angular momentum um, about that point. So let's evaluate that. Well, so ang the basic definition of angular momentum is not <laughs> angular momentum is equal to i omega. The basic definition of angular momentum is r cross p. So in this case, it's the vector r from our fixed point to the puck. So that's little r, vector little r, vector cross product with its momentum uh, to the right, r cross p. So that's the angular momentum of the puck about that point. And <clears throat> remember, we did this calculation before. That angular momentum about that point doesn't depend upon whether the puck is here or here or here. Anywhere along this line, it will have exactly the same angular momentum about that point. Okay, so, so that's the angular momentum of the puck about that point. The angular momentum of the stick about that point is, of course, zero. Okay, so this r cross p, well, what does it look like? It looks like this vector, r, cross this vector, p. But that cross product is exactly the same as taking just this component. So it's exactly the same as this cross this. Okay, same p in both cases, but instead of doing that r, we can do just that r. Instead of doing that r, we can do that r. Because the moment, uh, 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 sorry, the, the, the angular momentum about this point doesn't depend upon where you evaluate it. Okay, so let's evaluate it right here, just before it hits the stick. Okay? And so we have um, the length of this, so this r points straight up, and it is of length one half the, um, the, 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 the length of the stick. So it's L over 2 in the j hat direction. Okay. And that's because, I mean, if you do, uh, if you take this vector cross this vector, this vector is the same as that vector plus that vector. But, but that vector cross p is equal to 0. So that vector cross p is the same as that vector cross p. Okay, so that's an important trick to, to, to be aware of. Okay, it simplifies your calculations quite a bit. Okay, and so what is that? Well, um, this vector has magnitude uh, p. Uh, uh, to the right, and this vector has magnitude L over 2 in the up direction, and so the magnitude of the, of the cross product, because this is a right angle here, the magnitude is L over 2 times P. So it's L over 2 times the magnitude of P, and in what direction is it? Well, you just use the right-hand rule, so we're going this vector cross this vector, so that cross that is into the page. Okay, so that into the page, k hat comes out of the page, so into the page is negative k hat. So it's in the negative k hat direction, in other words, into the board. Okay, so that's the initial angular momentum of the system is of magnitude L over 2, this, this distance, times p, and it is a vector directed into the board. Okay, because um, when you look at it from, um, you know, an object slide, um, moving like this, it could be attached with a massless rigid rod to that point there and actually be rotating. And so it has angular momentum in that direction. So curl your fingers in the direction of the angular momentum and your thumb points in the direction of the angular momentum vector, which is into the board. Okay? So that's the, um, the initial angular momentum of the system. And since there are no external torques, that should equal the final angular momentum of the system. So let's evaluate that. So the system angular momentum in the final state after the collision, any time after the collision, because it's not changing, is equal to, well, it's equal to the angular momentum of a puck at rest relative to that point. So that will be an r cross p, or p is zero. Okay, and so that's zero. So the puck after the collision has zero angular momentum. And then there's an angular momentum associated with the rotational motion of this stick. And so let's just think of the stick as being at rest, and let's look at its angular momentum. Well, that angular momentum is clearly clockwise or into the board.
Okay, and so that angular momentum is going to be ICM times omega. Linear momentum is mass times velocity. Angular momentum for rotating rigid bodies, say about their center of mass, is ICM times their angular velocity. Okay, so how rapidly they're rotating radians per second. So that's plus ICM. Sorry, ICM is not a vector. But omega is a vector. <laughs> Okay, plus ICM times omega, and omega, the vector omega, is, it's a clockwise rotation, so it's into the page, into the board. Okay, so the, both the initial angular momentum of the system and the final angular momentum of the system are both into the board. They're both clockwise um, angular momentum. Okay, so we said that the angular momentum of the stick after the collision is equal to ICM times omega. That seems like that's obviously true, but we were a little cavalier in that. So ICM times omega, that's certainly the case if you have the center of mass point is at rest and the stick has a moment of inertia ICM for rotation about the center of mass, and there's an angular velocity omega, then the angular momentum of this situation is clearly ICM times omega. It's not so obvious, um, but that's the angular momentum about this center of mass point. Okay, but what we really want is the angular momentum about the fixed point O, not that moving center of mass point. It's not so obvious that the angular momentum of uh, when the center of mass is moving to the right like this, it's not so obvious that its angular momentum about that point is simply ICM times omega. It is actually, but as you know, students of physics, we need to be careful. Okay, we need to understand really what we're doing. So let's actually calculate the angular momentum of this, um, of this rotating and translating stick, not about that point, but about that point. Okay, so let's do this a little bit more carefully. Okay, so in order to do so, here is our fixed point O about which we are supposed to be evaluating our angular momenta. And at this instant of time, the center of mass is located, the center of mass of the stick is located some vector uh, displacement r to the right. Okay, and let us replace the stick with, um, with a simpler object, which is just a massless rigid rod with two point masses stuck on the ends. And so this stick is doing two things. One thing it's doing is if we hold the center of mass fixed, it's doing this. And so each mass is, has some linear momentum at that instant of time. And let's suppose that like, it's rotating like this. So this object is at this instant of time is moving that way. And it has some linear momentum. Let's call it little p, not to be confused with this little p. Okay? And this mass has a momentum negative little p. Okay? So there's some rotation here. And so the momenta are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, the linear momenta at that instant of time. Okay? But added to that is the stick is not just doing this, the stick is also, also translating to the right. So at this instant of time, we have to add to it the fact that both of these masses are translating to the right. And so they have some linear momentum both to the right. Okay? And let's call that linear momentum at this instant of time, let's call it little p prime, just to distinguish it from little p. So this mass associated with the translational motion of the stick, there's a momentum, linear momentum little p to the prime to the right. There's a linear momentum little p prime to the right for the bottom mass as well. Okay? And so the actual instantaneous momentum of linear momentum of that mass is little p plus little p prime. And the instantaneous moment, linear momentum of that mass is negative little p plus little p prime. Okay, so it's this complicated motion. Now remember that the basic definition of angular momentum is not i times omega. It's r cross p summed over all of the masses of that object in motion, in rotational motion and whatever. Okay, and so let's work this out. So we're going to run out of room over there. Let's put it down here. Okay. So what is the angular momentum of these two masses with those linear momenta about that point? Well, the definition of angular momentum is r cross p. Well, so what is the r? Well, in this case, for this, for this mass in motion, the r is this vector. And let's say this is the center mass point. Let's suppose, let's call at this instant of time the vector from here to here. Let's call that little r, not to be confused with that little r. Okay? And so if the vector from the center mass to that mass at, the, at one end is r, 
then the vector pointing from the center of mass to the other point will be negative r. Okay? So now we can work out, well, the angular momentum of that point, uh, of that mass in motion, uh, about that point is r cross p. So what is r? Well, it's that vector. That vector is equal to that vector, which is capital R plus little r. So we have a capital R plus little r vector cross product with the total linear momentum. Well, that's little p associated with its rotational motion plus little p prime associated with some translational motion. Okay, And then we add to that the, <coughs> the angular momentum of this mass about that point. Okay, and so we need this r. And so this r is equal to big R minus little r. So it's plus big R minus little r vector cross product. It's r cross p. Well, what is the total linear momentum of that mass at that instant of time? Well, it's negative little p associated with the rotational motion, positive little p prime associated with the translational motion. Okay, so let's expand this out. So what we have is there'll be eight terms. There will be a capital R cross little p, that cross that, plus a capital R cross little p prime, plus a little r cross little p, and then plus a little r cross little p prime. Okay, and then here we have a capital R cross negative p, that's negative capital R cross P. And then here is a cap positive capital R cross little p prime. And then negative negative, that's a positive little r cross little p. And then a negative little r cross p prime. Okay, so there's eight terms there. Six of them will cancel out. Okay, so let's look. The, we have a capital R cross little p. There's a negative capital R cross little p. That cancels out. And there is a positive little r cross p prime, negative little r cross p prime. Those two cancel out. Okay, so you got that. And then these two terms add a capital R cross p prime. However, p prime is the momentum, so the linear momentum associated with translational motion. It's to the right. Capital R is also to the right. Those vectors are parallel, and so their cross product is zero. And so this is zero, and this is zero. And so all we're left with is these two terms. So this is equal to just twice um, little r cross p. OK, and so what is that? Well, uh, little r cross p is there's, there's a rotational motion of this guy, and the linear momentum associated with the rotational motion is little p. And so r cross little p plus negative r cross negative little p is r cross p plus r cross p is twice r cross p is, in fact, the angular momentum of our object about that point, which is, of course, ICM times omega. Same thing. Okay, and so what we've just proven here is that the angular momentum, we've got this stick whose center of mass is moving to the right, and there's rotation about the center of mass. We've proven that the angular momentum of that stick in that complicated translational plus rotational motion, the angular momentum about that point is exactly the same thing as the angular momentum of the stick at rest about a fixed center of mass point, just ICM times omega. Okay, but you want to be careful about things. You want to understand this is a really important point. It plays a huge role in all kinds of problems. Okay, you need to understand that point in order to get the right answer. Okay, so very good. So we got that. And so what else? So, <clears throat> so now we say, okay, so this is the, um, the initial angular momentum in the system was this. It's, in, it's into the board in the negative k-hat direction, L over 2p. The angular momentum in the final is just ICM times omega into the board. And so we equate these two things, and we can solve for the angular velocity. So we have this, L over 2, uh, p, in the negative k-hat direction. So that's the angular momentum of the, of the, of the puck, okay? Um, um,
just before it hits the stick or any or any point along here. That's the angular momentum in the system to begin with. The angular momentum in the system afterwards is ICM times omega. Now omega is omega in the negative k-hat direction. So let's write that as negative omega uh, k-hat. And so we're imagining that um, omega is positive for clockwise rotation of the stick. Okay, And so then we can just solve for omega. So we get the angular velocity of the stick in the clockwise direction there is equal to uh, L times P divided by 2 ICM. Okay, so that's an important result. Okay, so we used um, conservation of linear momentum to solve for the center of mass velocity, the translational velocity of the center of mass point of the stick, and there it is. VCM is the ratio of the two masses times the initial velocity. And we used conservation of angular momentum um, uh, to solve for the, ang the final angular velocity of the stick as it does that. Okay? And so you can look at this thing and you can see that, yeah, this actually makes sense because this result for the angular momentum is greater. You know, what's going to increase the, 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 the spin rate of the stick? Well, it's greater under two conditions. If we make L or P larger, so larger uh, P or L, so obviously if you uh, give that puck a larger initial momentum, well, that stick is going to be rotating faster. Also, if you make the stick longer like this, um, or, or you know, hit it higher up versus lower, it's, it's harder to cause rotation when you're hitting low, because torque is R cross F. The bigger R is, then, then the larger the torque is. Okay? And so, so the bigger L would be, the, the easier it is to rotate that thing. Okay? And so it's going to cause a faster rotation. And it's also uh, greater, the angular velocity is greater for smaller ICM, because ICM is in the denominator. And that also makes sense, because if you have a stick that's very um, massive, very heavy, large moment of inertia, then the angular, that puck is going to hit it, and the angular velocity, it's hard to get that stick rotating. So the angular velocity afterwards is going to be small. But if the stick is very light, just made out of styrofoam or something like that, that puck hits it, it's very easy to get that thing spinning, and so the angular velocity is larger. Okay, so we've solved for uh, the final motion, assuming that the puck comes to rest. We have solved for everything to do with the final motion of that stick. It's linear motion and it's angular motion, using conservation of linear momentum and conservation of angular momentum. Okay, so now we're going to go to the next step, which is looking at conservation of energy. And that's going to reveal something really interesting about this problem. Okay, so I'll erase the board and I'll be back. Okay, just to recap, so we used conservation of linear momentum uh, to show that the translational momentum of the stick after the collision is, that's big P, is equal to the translational momentum of the puck uh, before the collision. Or we figured out the VCM, the velocity of the center of mass of the stick, is the ratio of the masses times the initial velocity of the puck. Okay, and then we used conservation of angular momentum to show that the final angular velocity of that stick is LP over 2 ICM. So now what's interesting is we have the final velocities um, after the collision, we have the initial velocities before the collision. So we can work out kinetic energies. We can work out kinetic energy final, kinetic energy initial. How do they change? Okay, is it an elastic collision? Is it inelastic? And remember, what we've done is we've assumed that the nature of the collision is such that the puck comes to rest as soon as it hits the stick. Okay? And so what are the consequences of that? Well, they're very interesting. And to work them out, we use conservation of energy. Energy is always conserved. <clears throat> okay, and so let's apply that powerful principle. Okay, so we're going to apply the conservation of energy in the form of the change in the total energy of an isolated system is equal to zero. Okay, so delta E total is equal to zero. Okay, so that means that um, 
So the change in the total energy, well, there's kinetic energy certainly involved. That could be changing. And then there's a change in other forms of energy. And these other forms of energy, as we've talked about before with collisions, linear momentum type collisions, these changes in other forms of energy could be, you know, there's an increase in thermal energy, there's, you know, sound that's generated, there's all kinds of things. Or you could have maybe an explosion go off, <laughs> okay, and that explosion could add kinetic energy to the system, so there could be changes in chemical energy, and so on, okay. So this delta E other, if it's thermal and sound and so on, this delta E other is positive, and the change in the kinetic energy is negative, kinetic energy goes down. But if you had, say, a little um, um, charge, a little explosive charge attached to the front end of that, uh, of that puck, and then as soon as it hit the stick, it exploded, well, that chemical energy could be converted into kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy could go up. So it could be that the kinetic energy actually increases, and then so other forms of energy uh, then go down. In this case, uh, chemical energy goes down in favor of kinetic energy going up. Okay, so all kinds of interesting things can happen here, depending upon the nature of the collision. <coughs> okay, so let's work this out. So we can easily work out the initial kinetic energy. So the initial kinetic energy, well, this has none. It's just a puck in translational motion. Okay, and so that's equal to one-half the mass of the puck times its speed squared, which you recognize is immediately equal to the momentum squared divided by twice the mass. This is super important, okay? So P is equal to mv. If you stick in mv for P here, you get back that. Okay, so these are two equivalent forms for kinetic energy. <coughs> okay, and then the final kinetic energy. Now, the final kinetic energy... If you look, there's two kinds of motion involved here. One is the stick is translating, and one is the stick is rotating. So there's kinetic energy, energy of motion stored in both of those types of motion. So there's kinetic energy associated with the translation of the stick, plus kinetic energy associated with the rotation of the stick. So that this motion here is translation without rotation, plus rotation without translation. Okay? And so we can add those kinetic energies up. Okay, so what do we get? So the translational kinetic energy of the stick, well, what we've got is a stick with a momentum capital P and a mass capital M. And so the energy um, associated with the translational motion is capital P squared divided by twice capital M. It's like little p squared divided by twice little m. Okay, plus the kinetic energy associated with rotation. Well, we have an object that <coughs> with a moment of inertia ICM for rotation about its center of mass. So that's just one half ICM times its angular velocity, final angular velocity squared. Okay, so now what you do is you say, so the final kinetic energy depends upon uh, capital P and, and omega. Well, we know that capital P is equal to little p, so for this, we can substitute in little p, okay? And omega, we have an expression for omega. We take this expression for omega, and we substitute it in there. And so then this expression will be proportional to little p squared, and this expression will be proportional to little p squared, because omega is proportional to little p. And so the whole kinetic energy final is proportional to little p squared. And so it's proportional to um, the initial kinetic energy. Okay, and so I'll let you work through the algebra. It's just one line of algebra. And what we get is that the kinetic energy final is equal to some fraction times the original, times the initial kinetic energy. We get little m over big M plus uh, little m times L over 2 squared divided by ICM. Okay, that times the initial kinetic energy. Now, I'll, I'll let you notice something immediately kind of interesting about this. So, kinetic energy final is some fraction of the original kinetic energy. So, it depends upon the ratio of the inertial masses, little m to big M. That's to do with the translational motion. But then, interestingly, look at this term. Little m times L over 2 squared, what is that? Well, that is the, um, the moment of inertia associated with um, an object of mass m uh, attached with a massless rigid rod to that point. So this is an elemental um, rigid body 
uh, of uh, uh, length L over 2 times mass M. That's the moment of inertia for that elemental rigid body. And you're comparing that moment of inertia to the moment of inertia of the stick about its center of mass. Okay? It's like the linear mass. It's the ratio of the linear masses divided by the ratio of the angular masses, so to speak. The, um, the moments of inertia. Okay, so that's interesting. Something interesting is going to emerge. So what we're interested in, in particular, is delta E other. What is delta E other? Is it positive, negative, zero? So delta E other is equal to uh, negative, the change in the kinetic energy. So change in kinetic energy is final minus initial. Negative that is initial minus final. Kinetic energy initial minus kinetic energy final. And what we're always interested in, we don't care what delta E other is. What we care is how does delta E other compare to another energy in the system, namely the original kinetic energy in that puck. So what you want to do is you want to factor out the kinetic energy uh, initial. And so <coughs> you want to write this as 1 minus kinetic energy final over kinetic energy initial times kinetic energy initial. Okay, so when you bring the kinetic energy initial inside, it's kinetic energy initial minus kinetic energy final. Okay, and so what you have is the, the, the kinetic energy that goes into other forms of energy is some fraction of the original kinetic energy, this fraction. Now this fraction is really interesting. So that fraction, that fraction can be positive, zero, or negative. Okay, that fraction will be positive if the final kinetic energy is less than the initial kinetic energy. So kinetic energy was lost. Where did it go? Well, it went into other forms of energy like thermal and sound and that kind of stuff, right? So this is definitely an inelastic collision. Okay. This, um, this, uh, uh, this quantity here can also be zero if kinetic energy final equals kinetic energy initial. That means no kinetic energy was converted to other forms of energy. That means delta E other is equal to zero. And that's by definition a perfectly elastic collision. Okay, But then there's also this final case, negative. It could be negative if kinetic energy final is bigger than kinetic energy initial. Well, how the heck is that possible? Well, it's possible, as I mentioned, we could have a little explosive charge attached to the front end of that puck. And as soon as it hits that stick, it explodes. And so it exerts forces on that puck backwards and forces on that stick uh, like to the left and forces on the stick to the right. And so it can add kinetic energy to the system. So kinetic energy final could be larger than kinetic energy initial. Okay, and so delta E other could be negative because the other energy is chemical energy. And that chemical energy went down um, as it was converted into other forms of energy, uh, kinetic energy. Okay, very good. So let's work this out then. So this ratio, 1 minus kinetic energy final over kinetic energy initial. So what is that? So it's a 1 minus. So kinetic energy final over initial, that's this thing, divided by kinetic energy initial, that's that. And so we just subtract this. So it's a minus little m over big M minus little m times L over 2 squared divided by ICM. Okay, so we got that, that's delta E other, and that's the fraction of the original kinetic energy. These are dimensionless numbers here. Okay, great. So let's look at these terms individually. Let's look at this term, let's call this term asterisk 1, let's call this term asterisk 2. This term is associated with, um, with the translational motion only. This term is associated with the rotational motion only. So let's separate those two and see what they're saying. Because what they're saying is something super clear and interesting. Okay, so what they're saying is this. So let's look at uh, this term over here and ignore this one. Okay, and so we're talking just about translation only. Translation only. Okay, and so the kind of situation we're dealing with is we're completely ignoring the rotational motion and looking just at the translational motion. So what we've got is a block of mass little m going to the right. So we'll draw it this way. So there's a little block of mass little m which is moving to the right with a speed v and it's going to hit a block. We're ignoring the rotation entirely. It's a block of mass big M okay, which was initially at rest. Big M initially at rest. And then after that collision, we're assuming that the block of mass little m comes to rest. 
So this is now at rest. And the, uh, the block of mass big M takes off with a velocity capital VCM. Okay? Ignoring the rotational motion, this is what's happening as far as translation is concerned. Okay? And so let's take um, the special case. So, we're, so, so this expression, if we ignore that, uh, it's delta E other is 1 minus little m or big M times kinetic energy initial. It's just this translational result. Okay, and so <clears throat> it will be true that delta E other is 0 when, um, when little m is equal to big M. Okay, so let's set, let's take the special case that little m is equal to big M. Okay, then delta E other should be equal to 0. And does that make sense? Well, if little m is equal to big M, and conservation of momentum, the original momentum is little m times v, the final momentum is big M times big VCM. If little m and big M are equal, if they're equal mass, well then uh, they have to be equal velocities. So VCM has to equal uh, little v. So VCM has to equal little v. And this follows from conservation of momentum. Delta P cis, linear momentum delta P cis is equal to zero. Conservation of linear momentum tells you that. Okay, but now these objects have, initially there's a kinetic energy one half little m little v squared. Finally, there's a kinetic energy one half big M big VCM squared. But the m's are the same, the velocities are the same, so the kinetic energies are the same. Okay, so that tells us kinetic energy initial is equal to kinetic energy final. Okay, so that means that there's been no transfer of kinetic energy into any other forms of energy. So it tells you that delta E other is equal to zero. <coughs> okay, and so by definition, this means perfectly elastic. Elastic. Perfectly elastic collision. And that makes sense because if you have, it's like the billiard balls example where you have two objects of equal mass <coughs> and then one comes to rest and then the other one takes off with exactly the same momentum and exactly the same kinetic energy, it's a perfectly elastic collision. Okay, so in order for in the case that little m equals big M, in order for uh, um, the puck to come to rest, it has to be a um, perfectly elastic collision in the case that the masses are the same. Okay? And then when that happens, then 1 minus little m or big M is 0, and so delta E other is equal to 0. Okay? So that's translation only. But there's also rotation. Now this is, this is exactly the same, but it's kind of interesting. Okay, so we'll do rotation only. Okay, so rotation only. So what we're going to imagine is this. We have the stick initially at rest. We're completely ignoring translational motion, and we're thinking of everything, just the rotational aspect of the motion. Okay, so we have an object, uh, um, a stick, with a moment of inertia ICM for rotation about its center of mass. And what we have is a puck of mass little m coming in with a speed little v. Okay? Now, the, um, the dynamics doesn't know whether this was a mass uh, which was in linear motion before it hit the stick, or it was a mass stuck on the end of a massless rigid rod of length L over 2 that just swung into the top of the stick. Okay, so we're going to convert this linear motion into, uh, into an equivalent angular motion. So now everything is angular motion. Okay, so it's just like this. Okay? And so what we imagine is a... Well, these are all point particles, but I have to separate this just to draw the diagram. Okay, so we're going to imagine a mass, a uh, little m, attached to a stick, a massless rigid rod of length L over 2, and this thing is swinging in like this. It's going like this. It's going bang, like that. And so it's got some angular velocity. Instead of this linear velocity, just before it hits the stick, it's got some angular velocity. Okay, and so that angular velocity, let's call that angular velocity omega prime. Now, if we make omega prime, if we make omega prime larger, then, then the mass little m will hit the stick higher speed. Okay, so we know we want that mass to hit the stick with a speed little v. Okay, and so we choose omega prime such that omega prime times L over 2, so the angular velocity of this, of this, of this massless rigid rod, <coughs> times the length L over 2 will be the tangential velocity of little m just before it hits the stick. So we set that thing equal to little v. Okay, 
That's what that omega prime is. Great, so now we've converted that translational motion into rotational motion. So now, and also we're talking about rotation only. So that means that this point right here is fixed. So we are not going to allow the stick to, to translate. We're going to hold this point fixed. And so we have this mass coming in, bang, it hits it. And the stick rotates only, but does not translate. So we have one rotating object hitting another object which can rotate. Okay, it's all about rotation. Okay, and so it looks like this. After the collision, um, little m on its little um, massless rigid rod of length over to us swung up and hit, um, hit the top of the stick, and it has come to rest. So this object has stopped rotating. So it's sitting like this. Okay, and it's not rotating. So this thing is at rest. Uh, just like this second rotating object, the stick was initially at rest. So this was, so the, so the mass M was originally rotating and the stick was at rest. Afterwards, the mass M is at rest, but the stick is rotating. So this point is fixed. That's really important. This point is fixed in position. We're dealing with rotation only and no translation. And so then this thing is going to be rotating with some angular velocity omega that we calculated before. Okay, that's the final angular velocity. Okay, now just like up here, so, so now we're dealing with rotation only, so we ignore this term, and what we have is... <coughs> so, oh, and battery's getting low here, I'm talking too long. <laughs> okay, so what we have is... If we ignore the translational motion, that drops out. And if we were to solve just this problem, we would get delta E other is 1 minus m L over 2 squared divided by ICM. Okay? And so that will equal 0. Uh, in other words, delta E other will be 0. In other words, it's perfectly elastic if this equals this. Well, what does that mean? Well, m times L over 2 squared, well, that's the moment of inertia for our mass m attached on this massless rigid rod of length l over 2. That's our elemental rigid body. So we're saying the moment of inertia for that swinging object, or rotating object, is equal to the moment of inertia for that rotating object, namely the stick. Okay, so let's, let's assume that. Just like we said little m is equal to big M, to make that thing equal to 1, now we're going to make little m l over 2 squared equal to ICM to make that term equal to 1. So then we'll get 1 minus 1 is 0. Okay, so let's do that. So let's say that m times L over 2 squared is equal to ICM, okay? So they are two objects with the same um, um, moment of inertia, okay? And so conservation of angular momentum is going to say, you know, uh, because they have the same moment of inertia, whatever the angular velocity of, of this, of the object on the left was to begin with, has to be the angular velocity of the object on the right. Just like this, the linear velocities had to be equal when the masses are equal. The angular velocities uh, before and after have to be the same. Okay, so then we're going to have um, omega um, prime, that initial angular velocity of that rotating object, has to equal uh, omega, the, the final angular velocity of that rotating stick. Okay, and so the moments of inertia of these two objects are the same this object and this object, and, and their angular velocities are the same. And so their kinetic energies are the same. So it tells you that the kinetic energy of this object initially is equal to the kinetic energy of that object in rotation finally. Okay? And so we get kinetic energy initial is equal to kinetic energy final. Exactly the same for the translational motion. Okay? And so that tells us that delta E other is equal to zero, and again, we're dealing with an elastic, perfectly elastic uh, collision. Okay? <clears throat> so that's nice. It's exactly the same thing as having two objects of equal mass, like the billiard balls, do this, kunk, vunk. Okay, this one comes off with exactly the same momentum. Uh, and velocity and so on. It's now we have two objects with exactly the same rotational uh, inertia or moment of inertia swinging like this, hitting. This one comes to rest and this one takes off with exactly the same angular velocity. Okay, they're 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 exactly analogous to each other. Okay, so then finally, let's put the translation and the rotation together. So we're not just dealing with this term alone or with this term alone. We're dealing with both of them. Okay, so. Now we have together, 
together what's happening. So delta E other, okay, so this delta E other is equal to this fraction of the original kinetic energy, which can be positive, negative, or zero. So let's look at these cases. So this is positive, zero, and negative. Let's look at the positive case. So for the positive case, <clears throat> we can make this, this number positive if this were we say 1 minus something minus something. If we make big M and ICM, <clears throat> you know, ICM is proportional to M. If we make big M and ICM really large, so basically just crank up the mass and the moment of inertia for this stick. So it's really hard to get this stick rotating. You have to exert a lot of torque to get this uh, stick twisting. Okay, then you have big numbers in the denominator here, and so 1 minus that number is definitely going to be positive. Okay, and so now you're talking about this. So this is cool. So now you have a super massive stick like this, high moment of inertia. It's hard to get that thing rotating. Okay, and so, but what you're saying is that, the, is that this puck um, comes to rest after the collision. How is that possible? How is it possible for a puck coming in like this, essentially hitting a brick wall, how is it possible for it not to just bounce back? It should just bounce. If it was elastic, it would just bounce back. Right? This is super massive. It's like hitting a brick wall. It would bounce back. But we're saying it comes to rest. So that's only possible if when it hits, it's an inelastic collision. And a lot of the kinetic energy is converted into thermal energy. And then the bounce back is, is, is well, bounce is not, no bounce back, <laughs> okay? And so the question is sort of like, um, you know, uh, for example, um, you know, how does, how could it not bounce back? From a very large M and ICM. Okay, because when M and I say are very large, this is positive. Okay, <clears throat> so how could it not bounce back unless it's inelastic? Okay, and some of the kinetic energy is converted into thermal energy, and so delta E other is positive, and so it's this kind of thing, thermal. Okay, now what about the case of delta E other equals zero? Well, now what you have is this is obviously elastic. Um, delta E other is zero. None of the kinetic energy was converted to other forms of energy. That's the definition of an elastic collision. Okay, so that means that this puck had some initial kinetic energy, and then afterwards it went to the kinetic energy of translation plus rotation of that stick, and none was converted to <coughs> other forms of energy. So what you have is, this is the elastic case, okay, the elastic case with a certain fraction of the original kinetic energy, that's big M, little m or big M times the original kinetic energy. That goes into uh, translational kinetic energy of that stick. Okay? And the other fraction of it, which is M, little m, times L over 2 squared, divided by ICM, times kinetic energy initial. That goes into the rotational kinetic energy, the energy associated with the rotation of the stick. That goes into K rotational, such that none of the kinetic energy is lost or converted into other forms. And then the final example, which is really interesting, most interesting, is this could be negative, the, this expression here. <coughs> so how could that happen? Well, um, so let's suppose that we have not a very large M and ICM, but suppose that we have a very small mass and ICM here. So this is an extremely light stick and this heavy puck is coming in like this. Now, obviously, that, that puck is just going to plow through and keep on going. So that puck should be moving to the right afterwards if we make ICM and M really small. Okay? And yet, we're saying we observed that, oh yes, it came to rest afterwards. Well, how is that possible? Well, it's possible, as I've mentioned before, the idea is we take a little... Um, um, a little explosive device, and we attach it to the front of this of, of this puck. And so, as soon as that puck comes into contact with that stick, it explodes. 
Okay, and so it pushes hard, so the, so the stick itself couldn't push hard enough back on the puck to bring it to rest, but the stick itself plus the explosion pushing back can bring that puck to rest. And moreover, that explosion goes both ways, and so it pushes hard on the stick to the right, and so the angular velocity of the stick will be large. Okay, so that's how you can explain, um, where is this here? So omega, so in this situation, omega will be large, and that's because ICM is small. So it's a very, very light stick. You can only have that happen if an explosion happens, and then, and then omega afterwards is large, okay? So a way to write this is, um, you know, it's going to not bounce back. Um, I shouldn't say not bounce back, not, um, not continue on, or not plow through. So not just like plow through that really um, that really low low moment of inertia stick. Not plow through um, a small mass and ICM stick. Okay. So the only way that's possible is if you find some way to add kinetic energy to the system, and that is say through chemical energy and an explosion. So for example. <coughs> You know, delta E chemical is uh, negative. So the chemical energy in that explosive goes down and it gets converted into kinetic energy. Because in this case, this is this last case over here, okay, so where the delta E other is negative. Okay, so that means that kinetic energy final was larger than kinetic energy initial. Where did it come from? Well, it came from chemical energy going down uh, after that, uh, with that explosion. Okay, so this is a super rich example. So I really encourage you to think carefully about this example. Uh, everything that was, was talked about here, so it involves, um, remember that objects with linear motion can have angular momentum. Okay, and so initially there's some angular momentum in the system that's equal to the final angular momentum in the system. Initially there's a um, linear momentum and finally there's linear momentum and so on. And then so you can solve conservation of linear momentum and conservation of angular momentum to determine the final velocities of everything, translational and rotational. Once you know that, then you can work out um, changes in kinetic energy. And so you can apply conservation of total energy to figure out what delta E other is. Okay, and so then delta E other, it'll be positive when it's an inelastic collision, it'll be um, zero when it's an elastic collision, and it'll be uh, negative if you found some other form of energy to convert into kinetic energy. Okay, so it's a very rich problem, and I really encourage you to, to try to master this kind of stuff at this level. Okay, this is sort of like a really good, uh, a nice, strong Phys 121 level of mastery. Okay, very good.